It's three o'clock. Hey, Jack, just, just Sunday. before you do, just, just to let folks know, in room two is Tim Knickerbocker, yeah. right? Talking about printing in the pandemic. Yes. And then uh, here in room one, you guys, uh, bless you for putting on this panel. are going to talk about why this is a great time to be self-publishing, yeah? Yes. <laughs> And if, you're, if your mute button is on, folks, uh, be sure you turn it off or you can turn it on and off you know, whenever you wanna speak, but it's, it's set for uh, the default is, fall, is off. So make sure that you're on. Um, and I do highly in, encourage you to, if you're sitting in today on this, to watch uh, Tim Knickerbocker's presentation. It is just fascinating to see the, the technology that's involved in printing books these days. I mean, it really, and you will be, you will be absolutely blown away, but don't leave now. You can, you can watch it in the recording later, okay? <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Jack Rochester. I am a board member of IPNE, very happily so. Uh, it's a great organization and I've had um, a, a super, Bunch of fun getting this conference, uh, being being a helper, helpmate, and getting this conference going. We got some really good speakers all across both of these days. Really good. I'm I don't know how I'm going to watch it at all, but I but I'll try. Um, I have worked in publishing since 1974. Uh, of course, at that time I was only two years old. So, uh, but it was it was new to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I have I've worked as, as an editor for a couple of different publishing companies. I, I became um, a nonfiction professional writer myself. I started my own company, Joshua Tree Communications, in 1983. And in, in uh, 2003, I changed the name to Joshua Tree Interactive because of the changes in technology, uh, how it had affected publishing. And uh, I still continue to write. I love writing. I write novels. I am a ghostwriter for business books. And I blog and I, I, I write vicious letters to the, op, uh, to the editors at uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I just have a lot of fun writing. And writing's always been fun for me. And I hope it will always be fun. Uh, and doing things like this today are really, are really part of the fun. Um, you're going to hear from some very knowledgeable people on this panel discussion today. Um, we are int our intent is to uh, is to whet your appetite, so to speak, and help you focus on other topics that you're going to be interested in seeing and uh, sitting in on over the next couple of days. And as I was saying before we started, if you missed it, um, uh, please go back and, and watch the video uh, and listen to Angela Bowl, the president of IBPA, because in many ways, she was a prelude to what we're talking about here on the panel discussion today. And uh, uh, the, it's, it's kind of a continuation of what, what she was talking about and uh, in terms of how um, this has become the days, we are in the days of self-publishing now, but when we say self-publishing, uh, we cannot discount the importance and the influence of indie publishing. Um, what we can discount to some extent is the, uh, the, uh, the lack of opportunity in trade publishing, going with one of the big five publishers. And if you don't believe me, I want to show you, this was from the Sunday New York Times. Okay, and I'm gonna qu quote from this article in my little introduction that I'm gonna do here before we turn it loose for the other panelists. But um, best sellers sell the best. And uh, what's, what's happened in my humble opinion with New York Publishing, which we, includes getting an agent to represent you, is that you have to be already so freaking famous that uh, doing a book is just like something you do on the side for a couple of million dollars. And uh, if, you don't, uh, if you don't have that kind of chops, you're probably not gonna get into New York publishing, but the, the side effect or the, the, the down, downstream effect that's gonna have on trade book publishing is they're gonna paint themselves into a corner where they've used up all the celebrities and all the famous people and all the pol politicians and there won't be anybody left to publish <laughs> for them, right? <laughs> but um, 
we're not we're not quite there yet, but we've got we've got the market that belongs to us now, authors and indie publishers. We own publishing. New York doesn't own publishing anymore, okay? In my opinion. So we're gonna go on that premise. Um, the growth in publishing is, is pretty interesting to see. Um, one thing that may surprise some of you is to learn that print is the number one medium for books these days. Um, and these, these, th this, this growth pattern is somewhat affected by COVID because people are staying home now um, and reading more. But one thing that Angela brought up in, uh, in, a, in her session two hours ago <laughs> really, really surprised me. She asked, how many books do people read? You know, they, they collect all these statistics at, at IBPA, the, the uh, Independent Book Publishers Association, which is our parent company uh, entity, by the way, not company, but entity of, of IPNE. Um, she said, how many books do people read a year? So we were all throwing out these numbers, right? And she comes back and says, well, you're all wrong. It's one, one book a year. I go, oh my God, I can't believe that. You know, I read, I read a book every two weeks. <laughs> so anyway, print is still number one. Audio is number two. Number three is eBooks. And uh, that's, eBooks have slid down, but they haven't, they haven't gone away. Um, in fact, indie, indie authors who have published their books on Kindle um, in, uh, in 2019, thousands of them earned more than $50,000 in royalties, and a thousand of them earned $100,000 in royalties. And that's pretty good. I mean, that's nothing to, to sneer at, um, but um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a changing market. We're not really sure where it's going right now. The, the Nook kind of got shot in the back mm -hmm. by the uh, uh, um, Barnes and Noble hack. Um, it really, really hurt the Nook business a lot. Um, and um, so we'll see what happens with that. But there's a lot of diffusion coming about in publishing now. And that's having a, a large impact on small publishers and authors. And um, even though the name is kind of unmemorable, uh, it's wise to check out bookshop.com and see what they're doing because um, Bookshop intermediates, intermediate, intermediated itself between buyers of books and bookshops so that you could go to Bookshop and order a book from your favorite or even if you didn't know the bookstore yourself, you could order the book through them and get it much more quickly than you ever could have, if you could have gotten it at all by contacting the bookstore directly. So um, it's that's the kind of business we're in right now. We're looking, we're looking at all these different ways, kind of like what happened in software ten years ago. Um, it's going the same direction. So um, a couple quick comments, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel here. But um, uh, book book sales. Have, uh, have resurged. Uh, unit sales are up over 60%, six, excuse me, 6% in 2020 over what they were in 2019, according to NPD BookScan. And ebook sales and digital audiobook sales are also up. These days, you really have to have a book on all three platforms. You got to be paper, whether it's paperback or hardcover, doesn't matter. You got to have an audio book. You got to have a, 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 a an electronic ebook, whether it's a Nook or a Kindle. Most people default to the Kindle because they want to have their book up on Amazon. So, and if you do that, then Amazon is not going to let you be on another platform with your ebook. <laughs> so um, that seems to be what's happening there. And uh, of the New York publishers, this is drawing from this article that I, I mentioned to you here. Uh, Penguin Random House is the largest publisher in the New York Five. Uh, in fact, it's larger than all four of the other four combined. It prints, uh, uh, it has more than 300 imprints and a backlist uh, that is just a killer, um, which is helping to keep them alive. Um, but eight of the 20 best-selling print books of 2020 of that, of that, um, Excuse me. They, Penguin Random House published eight of the 20 best-selling print books in 2020, and has had 216 bestsellers this year. Um, 
So you can kind of get the sense that there's there's some nepotism going on between the New York Times and New York publishers. Let's keep our, our little publishing business alive here. Um, but um, the, the whole idea uh, for the way uh, the sense of how things have improved and gone, gone so crazy with Penguin Random House can be attributed to Madeline McIntosh, who is now their current CEO, who worked for Amazon for a couple of years in the book business and knows how to work the algorithms that are necessary to boost sales on books. And so uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling tautology to see what, what um, the, the ebook, I mean, the, the, uh, the publishing business, whether it's newspaper or books or what, how they're helping, to, helping each other out. Because the slogan they have is the best sellers that sell best are the best sellers that selling the best are because they're best sellers. So it's kind of a tautology. Um, and one, one, one more quick little comment, and then I'm going to get off and, and I'm not going to chatter about a bunch of more statistics, but um, the, uh, the way that um, I'm sort of sifting down through more notes than I have time to talk about. Um, but um, um, well, there's a quote here from publish from the founder of Publishers Marketplace, Michael Cater, which kind of summarizes stuff. He says that the New York publishers are not going to have the next wave of books sitting on the backlist if they take if the takeaway lesson is that they don't need anything other than big books. And that's our market. Our market is not being a big book, but still being a successful book. And that's 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 what we have to work on. Um, it's not it's not maybe getting to the very top of the, the pyramid, but um, being in the middle to high ground would be a would, would be a place that would be pretty comfortable, and will maybe put you in that that marketplace that I was talking about with the Kindle books a little a few minutes ago, um, where authors are really doing quite well. Um, so, um, Madeline McIntosh has certainly turned uh, turned a lot of the conventional thinking about how to be a book publisher around, and has had a lot of foresight into the technology necessary, you know, developing these algorithms and, and, and working all these statistical kinds of um, configurations. But um, when we turn around and ask that question for ourselves, what will you be doing as an indie publisher and an author? What are you looking for in your next publishing relationship? What are your goals? What do you want to get out of it? What do you want to put into it? Because those are the questions you really need to ask yourself. Um, and again, I hearken back to um, Angela's presentation earlier because um, it's something you gotta sit down and really think through. Like, um, it's not, I wanna sell more books. It's not, I wanna make a million bucks. It's, those aren't the reasons for doing this. That's not why we're in publishing. We're there for another reason. And there was, um, one uh, person on the previous call with uh, David Hahn, who, who nailed this perfectly. She said, I hate marketing. I hate publicity. I have a message I want to get out and share with other people. That's what's really important to me. So um, without any further ado and rambling around, I want to introduce the panel to you. If I haven't done it already, I'll do it again. Ralph Henley, Stephen MacArthur, and Rhodes Murphy, and I'm going to let them each introduce themselves to you, and then uh, we'll move right into uh, some of the some of the points that we'd like to discuss. We're going to keep this wide open for you guys. If you have a question, please speak up. Don't wait. Um, make sure you've got your your mute unmuted, <laughs> and and share your thoughts with us. This is a the synergistic process here we want to go through today. Nobody has a, a corner on all the knowledge, all the information that we need. So let's share, okay? So Ralph, go ahead, please. Okay, well, uh, my name is Ralph Henley. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my company is Publish and Launch, and we do self-publishing support services like editing 
and uh, uh, book production. Um, I, uh, Jack, it's interesting that you got started, you say you got started in 74 and I, and, uh, so you beat me, I'm 79. Uh, I'm not 79 years old. I mean, I started in 79. So, uh, okay. <laughs> that was the year that my wife published her first book. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of how we, how I got started in publishing. I've been producing and publishing books for over 40 years. And I got into book publishing by assisting my wife. Her name is Karen Henley. She's a published author with many titles. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we, we kind of started in self-publishing when there was no such thing. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, we, uh, she and I collaborated on a series of books and recordings. They were Bible stories. Uh, we found an illustrator and started making these little books. And then a, uh, an entrepreneurial independent publisher got wind of what we were doing. And he jumped in with the capital and picked up this series and marketed it to the Christian bookstore world. This is 1985. And um, <clears throat> That turned into, and then eventually an even bigger publisher bought the series and consolidated it into one volume and called it the, Be the Beginner's Bible, which then became an international bestseller. Um, it was translated into 17 languages and sold millions of copies and all because we... Karen and I were just doing what we love to do at home and and uh, doing the best we could to publish. And so we were sort of a we, we felt like we sort of fell into this thing, uh, which then I I was a musician, but I stopped doing any other work and began and became her manager. And over time, um, I represented her in con contract negotiations, became a de facto agent mm -hmm. um, in 2015. So I'm sorry. You don't do any agenting now, though. No, you? no, uh, I would not dare do that. Uh, I don't have the, you know, I don't have all the contacts I'd really need to do that appropriately. So I, what I, I your primary focus with your company now, you and Karen. Well, Hill. well, uh, I was just getting ready to say that in 2015, I had a little chat with Julie Shirky, who was going to be on our panel today. And she, she encouraged me to go into uh, book shepherding or. Uh, basically helping, helping um, authors self-publish their books. And so I've been doing that for five years uh, now. It's my, it's my major emphasis. Uh, after a 30 year career in publishing, my wife has kind of backed off and I manage her backlist. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, I started this, we started this work before there was an internet. And then as the internet came along, we were one of the first people to put up a website. Uh, then Amazon uh, started their ad advantage program and eventually, uh, uh, you know, they bought Create Space. And we've just been kind of growing along with them. And I would take Karen's backlist once, once a, a trade publisher was done with it, I'd take the backlist and and republish it. We, we, were, we, we were advised early on to always get a reversion clause in our contracts. So all Good of point. Karen's work, 30 years of work, it's all reverted. Some of it is self-publishable and some is not. It's yeah, uh, meaning if you get back a 300 page color children's book, it's very difficult to it's very it's very expensive to put all that back into print so most of the color work other than the covers i've not been up to now i've not put that back into print but um so we have an extensive backlist on our on our website karenhenley.com so that's i'll just i'll stop there that's that's kind of my place in all this i you know i don't have a degree in publishing and, and all that stuff never never lived in new york but i, I feel like uh it's just been it's been all these years in the in the trenches doing the next thing. And so I'm perfectly happy to answer questions and give my insight. That's the way a lot of us fell into it. We didn't we didn't have a degree in publishing, perhaps maybe English, maybe English, English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, please introduce yourself. 
I'm Stephen MacArthur, and I'm from Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, so we're we're in the heart of, uh, although on the edge, but we're in the heart of uh, New England. Uh, I was on the board for three years of IPNE and enjoyed it greatly, and have really uh, appreciated the uh, the membership uh, with IPNE. And I miss being able to go to physical meetings, to trade shows that IPNE <laughs> attends. Those are the kinds of things that were really and will eventually, I hope, be valuable to us uh, in the future. Um, I come out of a, a political background. I, I worked on a presidential campaign staff. I was uh, chief of staff for a member of Congress, uh, spent uh, quite a few years in Washington, D.C. before moving to Vermont in 1980 and getting involved in the music business. Uh, I uh, had always been and still am, uh, although I don't play anymore, a musician. And I worked for uh, a number of record companies, uh, Silo Music uh, Distribution, and I, I worked for Rounder Records. And as a result of that, I got involved with a project with the Smithsonian uh, where we we co-produced uh, with the Smithsonian an 800 uh, performance collection of uh, videos of primarily uh, world music uh, and dance uh, performances from fi 500 in one collection and then 300 in another collection um, from about 100 countries uh, around the world. Uh, and that got me a little bit into the book business because we published nine books uh, that uh, accompanied those so that when the music business began to die uh, in around 2010 for us at least uh, we had developed by then a, about 3,000 3,500 uh, tracks of music that we owned and we saw the handwriting on the wall with the disappearance of, of physical music sales um, and we're now entirely in digital sales of music. Um, and my wife and I um, enjoyed putting uh, those books out and some other books in the music business. And we decided to, uh, uh, she's an author and an editor, published author. And we decided to start a publishing company. Uh, next year will be our fifth anniversary. Uh, her third book was published by She Writes Press and uh, we uh, really appreciated how they did things. And we decided to uh, create a hybrid publishing uh, partnership kind of company, which we have. Um, and there are a lot of details about how we do things, um, which I, th I think threads the needle in many ways of different kinds of publishing. Um, and uh, we're, we're having uh, a lot of fun. We're getting uh, some growing recognition. Uh, we started with uh, authors in Vermont and we now have authors uh, scattered all over the country. So um, that's, I'll stop there and uh, let uh, Rhodes introduce himself. So. Okay, I wanna I'll just inter interject here. Stephen in his modesty has not mentioned that the name of his publishing company is Rootstock Publishing. <laughs> And I encourage you to check out his website and to look at the value add that he does as a publisher because he's uh, he's he's uh, snatched uh, all the best stuff from how publishing used to be and integrated it into his business model, and it's fantastic. It's really worth taking a look at. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and Rhodes Murphy, please hey. step up on the microphone here and uh, and tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, I'm Rhodes Murphy. <laughs> I'm the uh, author ambassador and an associate publicist at Books Forward. We're a um, author publicity and book marketing firm based originally out of Nashville. I think we often miss our founder, Julie, pretty well. Um, and now we have offices in New York, um, in New Orleans. I just moved to New York, so now there's an office in New York, um, as well as a couple in some different countries. Um, we mostly focus on, you know, author publicity. We've had a lot of success helping self-publish and independently published authors and small presses kind of gain footholds in the door and 
building a platform for themselves. Um, it's hard to, especially in this environment where there is so many books, it's hard to underplay the importance of publicity and also pursuing publicity in the right way. Um, I also, I think it's strange that everyone else on this panel was involved in the music industry because I used to be involved in the music <laughs> industry. <laughs> it's so so yeah. weird. Okay. I planned it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, I appreciate you being here today. I can say guys now because Julie isn't on the panel anymore. So, um, and uh, we we miss her. I've invited her to come back next year since uh, she was un un unable to this year. But I think we are very fortunate to have Rhodes here as well. So um, some of the, well, let me just start with um, with one thought and explore it and open this up to our attendees and, and have them pop questions up for us as well um, because that's what it's all about. It's about you guys who are here to, to gather information and for us to provide that, that information for you. So you can either speak or you can chat with us. If you look at the bar, the menu bar down at the bottom, um, make sure you're unmuted. And if you'd like to chat, if you want to just type in your question, you can do so right there. But um, for starters, just to just to get things kind of kicked off here, um, one of the, the theme of this was the th there's never been a better time to self-publish. So why are we saying that that's true? Um, Rhodes, why don't you take it first and and run it around the, the track? Okay. I mean, there's lots of obvious reasons. I think. Um why self-publishing is really taking off right now. Just clearly, it's a lot easier for authors to kind of get around, circumvent the process of finding a traditional publisher, especially now that, you know, there are so few. <laughs> um, and kind of put their book out there whenever they want to. So you have a lot of autonomy. And part of that autonomy is that it, you can control pricing, you can have full creative control. Um, and you could really put your book out just the way you want to, if that's what you want to do. Um, yeah. Okay, Stephen. So we're we're as I said, we're a hybrid partnership publishing company, but we do things a little differently from what would normally be called a self-publishing um, venture or self-publishing. Uh, organization. Um, we are very much a curated press so that we're, we're, we, we, we accept manuscripts based on the, uh, the quality of the writing, uh, uh, what level we have uh, various protocols that we use to judge uh, the manuscript. And, and we are also um, uh, Kind of between, uh, 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 like let's say a, a she writes press and uh, a traditional press. We will provide some marketing, some promotion. We'll help authors with their social media platforms. We give them advice about their their uh, websites. Uh, we help them figure out how to get their profile onto Amazon and Goodreads. We do a lot of things because we believe that the only way we're going to make our share of the royalties is if the author has success. Um, so we know they have to have success if they have a good manuscript. That's the first thing for us. Uh, the second thing is, uh, are they interested? And I just attended a wonderful uh, event with David Hahn uh, are they extroverts or are they introverts? You know, and from our perspective, the authors that are extroverts are the ones that are going to take their book and really, with our help, uh, do something with it that, that could be successful or at least more successful than just uh, some of the self-publishing ventures, which are, are just, you know, let's get your book out and that's that. So anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's uh, you know, if, if we go back to the 60s and the 70s, maybe even before that, um, self-publishing was uh, a one publisher business called Vantage Press. 
Anybody, I mean, anybody remember Vantage Press? Uh, <laughs> I remember my father-in-law at that time had his book of poetry published by them and it cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And they gave him hundreds and hundreds of boxes of books that he could put underneath the bed in the spare bedroom. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And look at where we are now. Look at how we've grown. Um, so I uh, just a little, little piece. Ralph, Ralph, you want to take it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, that that phrase, there's better, never been a better time to self-publish, that's been a favorite of mine for several years, uh, ever since I uh, heard a, an interview with Seth Godin on, uh, on uh, NPR one night, and, uh, and he said something that really caught my, or was very, in, in, encouraging because uh, having uh, having kind of you know uh, been in publishing a couple of decades and and seeing the uh, seeing the internet disrupt our traditional models and I we were privileged enough to have participated in the traditional model for a while so it was quite challenging to see publishers that we'd worked with a long time begin shrinking uh, and uh, printing, you know, going overseas and then the internet coming in and so forth. Uh, but here's what Seth Godin said in so many words. He said, you know, actually what makes the, the internet makes it possible for an individual to, to put their art out there at reasonably low cost. And, um, and so, yeah, when you think about it, you've, you know, Via, via YouTube and Vimeo, you can have your own TV channel. Uh, via Kindle Direct Publishing or Ingram Spark, you can, you can have a print on demand distribution system. Uh, with, it, with your blog, you can like be publishing a magazine. Um, with your podcasting, you can do radio. And so it's just so from that perspective, it is just a, a tremendously empowering era when you've got all these things at your fingertips. Now, uh, Jack, since we had a discussion about having this panel, the areas where I begin to have doubts are in more late, you know, later year or more recent years, as things have have like. Um, Rhodes mentioned there's more and more books on the market. There's so that so this these opportunities have created a, a marketplace where we're just glutted with books. And so it's got a lot way harder to get attention. And and of course, my my wife having a very good track record in publishing, you know, we we can really feel the difference. Uh, even somebody with Karen's credentials, uh, uh, the last time she published a book about in 2018 it was very difficult to get it to get any uh any, or i'll say this it was harder to get attention it's still possible it's just it's just more challenging so uh i still believe because of the what i said about tv channel and magazine and so forth it is a great time we still have these tools available but i think what we've got to do is continue to work smart and and I'll just put a plug in for this right now. I'm very <laughs> concerned about the editorial quality of self-published books. Yes, indeed. Because the gatekeepers, I won't mention their names, but the print on demand platforms, they are very quick to take in your mm -hmm. book, but there's no accountability there for a well-edited book. And right. I've worked with some some authors who just insisted that a copy edit was all they needed. And, you know, after a while, I just don't argue with them. I mean, they're the ones paying the bill. This is your book. So we yeah. put it out there and the reviews start coming in. And that sometimes a reviewer will say, you know, this is really choppy. The storyline started about nine times <laughs> and there's way too much backstory. And in, in, in other words, newbie mistakes. And yeah. so while it's a great, we have great opportunities today to, to self-publish, 
but we've also got greater responsibility than we used to have to, to really produce a book that's worth somebody's time. Yeah, I totally agree yeah. with that, Ralph, in that we, we get yeah. manuscripts for publicity every day and feel that, you know, at a certain point, we can recommend editing, um, you know, recommend that they go to a service like yours or our company Books Fluent to just help them get their book in shape or maybe push the release date out a little bit longer, um, do some more development. But at a certain point, we have to turn people away because we don't want to take their money. It would be unethical, we feel, to um, have someone sign up for a publicity campaign that we don't think is going to return them value because of the quality of the book. Yeah, you know, one one thing about you, Ralph, and you, Rhodes, is that you represent uh, a really important ally to the author who's self-publishing. Um, and on the other hand, there are also a lot of editors out there who are allies to self-publishing authors. And oftentimes, authors choose not to to ally themselves with the editors or proofreaders. And then they don't ally themselves with people like you who can really help them publicize, market, advertise, promote, and, you know, be able to get their book out. They, they somehow think that they can just write whatever they want to write uh, and think it's the best thing they've ever written or that's ever been written. And then just have somebody print it and hey, but it, it just doesn't work that way. And I, what, I, what I've seen is so many more editors uh, available to, um, and, and we have a whole creative partners team like that with editors and graphic designers. Uh, and then people like you who were doing the kind of work that the, the big five used to do for, for authors available to self-published authors. So I, I think this is all a part of the good stuff that's happening with self-publishing. I mean, I agree. I think that it's, it's just so important that authors take the time to make sure that we're not emulating the big five with their book, but <laughs> right. we wanna make sure that it'll look good on a shelf, read like a book that you could buy at any store. And I mean, ultimately that's what everyone wants. Did, did, you hear, did, did you hear what Angela Bowl said about uh, the percent of the return on advances for the big five? I did not. Yeah, uh, she asked the question of everybody who was there, what do you think the percentage return is on an advance from a big five to an author? Well, how, mu how much do they, how many, what percent pays out is really the- but is, is, yes, it's 3%, 3%. David, David was very eloquent about his, oh my God, this is not business. <laughs> this, this, this is something fantastical. Yeah. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, I think that the resources involved is the biggest barrier for a lot of self-published authors though, because it does take time and it takes resources to hire editors, hire quality editors, have a quality you know, cover design. Um, can, I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Uh, I got started the same year Ralph did in, in terms of publishing. I, I self-published in 79. And back then, you know, the gatekeepers were, were the big publishing companies. And they, they wouldn't, I mean, I don't know exactly how much they invest in the book these days, but I would say, you know, by the time they decided to publish, they're probably talking 50 to 100 grand. Now that, the, now that you know, we have all these resources available, I, I totally agree this is the best time to, to publish, to self-publish, to hybrid publish, whatever you want to do. There's all these free tools out there um, and, and quality is sort of up to you, but it's also still pay to play in many ways. And you know, you could buy advertising and be, be in front of millions of people. Uh, people buy advertising on Facebook. You can also do it for free. You can also do your own covers. I see so many covers from small presses, self pub they scream self-published. I mean, they literally look yeah. like crap when Canva's out there, you're out there. I mean, you know, Fiverr is out there. Um, 
but I think you're always going to find a very small percentage of people who care about quality, who have quality material. The vast majority of people, you know, somebody said how many, Angela asked, how many, how many books does an average person read a year? The answer was one book a year. So the mass market of all these people and all, you know, everybody wants to write a book and they think they have something to say. Most of them, <clears throat> most books are not very good, you know, they, and they don't, <laughs> it reminds me of what Samuel Johnson said. He was reading somebody's manuscript and he said, he wrote the guy a letter and said, your manuscript is both interesting and original. Unfortunately, the parts that are original are not interesting. The parts that are interesting are not original. So that's what you see from all these. I mean, I see, you know, anyway, I mean, yeah. but I'm still very I bullish on publishing. So yeah. publishing. I just want to insert one little thing about this thing about, you know, about not being cheap. You know, if, you, if you're going to if you're going to publish a book, you've got to have it edited properly and well by a professional. And I just wanted to anecdotally share with you the last book I read was the number one bestseller on the New York Times list, uh, book review list, right? And I was trying to find it. It's, it's right in the one of the, the very first chapters, but the main character is named Jake. And, and within the first 30 or 40 pages, it's Jack instead of Jake. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the number one bestseller from Doubleday, okay? So you can't just let your sister do the proofreading. You just can't. You gotta, you gotta get it done by a professional. Yep. But can I just answer, uh, say one other thing? Um, Seth, I'm in marketing and that's my profession and I'm also a writer and all that. But I, I met Seth Godin once and then you know, have followed him for a long time. He also wrote a book called All Marketers Are Liars, okay? So if you go look at look on Amazon, you'll see Seth Godin, all marketers are liars. And then his publisher, it didn't sell very well. So they said, well, you know, maybe we should change the title because people are getting the right idea or the wrong idea. You have to decide whether it's the right or the wrong. So he, anyway, he they changed the title by he they crossed out all our liars and wrote in tell stories. Okay, and it started selling. So Seth talks about this in his book, how it started selling because, you know, it was supposed to, the, the title was supposed to be a joke, but people didn't get it. Plus, so much of marketing is total crap. You know, I mean, like, we have the best this. We are the first this, you know. And I mean, it's, people don't trust marketing. And when somebody said at the other thing, I hate marketing, I hate selling. Uh, if uh, I have news for that person, if you want to be successful, you want to sell books, you have to learn something about marketing and selling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you could, but but I'm an artist. I'm pure. You know, I'm. Pure. Yeah, and that's, that's fine. That's fine. You can be an artist and have your book, and you know, put it on your mantle and show it to your friends when they come to visit for cocktail parties and stuff like that. But if you want to sell books, you can't leave that to somebody else. Um, the analogy I was making earlier about um, about how. We, we, we've been taught to dial our own telephones. Well, we've got to do our own marketing. There's nobody else who's going to do it for us. You can hire some marketing people to help you like David Hahn, but you know, at, in the final analysis, if you're not managing the marketing and publicity process for your own book, nobody knows your book as well as you do. You have got to lead them and show them what's really cool about your book because nobody else really gets it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'd like to add something to that. Um, I'm thinking now about anybody listening to us talk, and maybe they haven't published their book yet, or it's in process. Um, and lest we scare any, anybody off who, who may not have deep pockets, you, you can hire all, for all these things. Yes. You can also do them yourself if you go slow enough and you're willing to learn. There are books out there that tell you, uh, that talk about the, the uh, like in fiction, the, the mistakes that are often made. Like, like Jack, you just made an illustration of one when you said the character name changed within yeah. 30 pages. 
that is a that is a newbie mistake and is you know quite shocking to hear about it in the John Grisham book. <laughs> but um, but so I just want to say that you know if you if you're going slow enough and you're not in a hurry, then you can train yourself to do some of these things. And even marketing, marketing can be a very simple, uh, you can start with baby steps and a great guy who takes that, who, who I've always thought was really good in explaining that is Dan Blank. Dan uh, Blank is fantastic. You should sign up for Dan Blank's email <laughs> newsletter, costs you nothing. Yeah, perfect, Dan Jack. That's a good K, right? Is it K or C? Uh, it's a uh, C, isn't it? Let me see. Dan, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Uh, Dan Blank's last name. Is oh, it it's it's okay. it's B A B L A N K. Dan yeah. Blank and his and his uh, website is we we grow media we grow media dot com. And he's got loads of tips in his newsletter. And then he's got a book uh, yep. where he talks all about. But basically, it's all about building a readership. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's got a wonderful uh, paradigm that um, uh, he said, he often says, all you need is 100 followers. If, if, you, if, you, if you set up a, some simple uh, uh, social media and you have a website and then and a, a mailing list and, and then try to grow your list to a hundred people. Uh, he says, you can do a lot with a hundred people who really believe in what you have to say. Absolutely. I, if I could follow up with you, Ralph, um, I totally agree with what you're saying in terms of, um, there are things that the authors, that authors can do on their own. And I know that Books Forward is like, we're trying to roll out, um, more affordable plans because often we do have authors that say, I don't want a full publicity campaign because I know social media or I know how to do this. I just need you to guide me or um, I want a publicity campaign, but I only have like a $3,000 budget. We are trying to come up with packages that um, can be really flexible and kind of give authors at different prices, like collections of things that they can do on their own kind of with our oversight. And I think part of the future, um, if we wanna prevent all of our self-published authors from just getting scammed all the time by uh, crummy <laughs> services, is to create these packages that, are, that can be more flexible and um, give them advice on how to not only go about publicity the right way, but navigate the market and just kind of get a sense of, of where they are. Mm. That's a great comment. I really, I really res uh, resound. Uh, that's a great comment, Rhodes. And it, it uh, dovetails right into a question we had from one of our attendees, Gail, said, talk about the future of self-publishing. What excites you most about the future? What should authors be preparing for that they might not be thinking about enough today? Um, it's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> long, long, long ago, um, it, it feels like in a galaxy far away, I, I sold encyclopedias door to door. Um, I did that too. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, was 19, I was 19 years old and I, I had a field manager who had, who had been a fuller brush salesperson uh, back in the 40s and 50s. And uh, this guy said to me one day, soon after I started, he said, MacArthur, here's one thing. It doesn't cost you a thing except a few minutes of your time when you're, when you're knocking on doors. Uh, just, just keep this in mind. The more doors you knock on, the more doors will open. And I've kept that with me ever since in just about everything I've ever done. And it's one thing I always tell our authors is, look, you know, if this is going to be a partnership, it has to be our expertise helping you do all of these things, but you can't just sit there and hope things happen. You really have to, if we give you a list of bookstores in your state that are within, you know, uh, an hour's drive of you, 
uh, that you can go to and give the owner a book or the events coordinator a book and you can you can tell them that you're a local state author and you'd love to come and do an event. Of course, this is before COVID, do a virtual event now. Um, that, that's the kind of knocking on the doors that you need to be doing. And I, part of the answer to, to Gail's question, I think, is um, what do they need to be thinking about? They need to be thinking about what they can do to really help sell and market their book, as Ralph said. They really do. And you know what? You know, you really bring up a, a good point, Stephen, because with the, the COVID change, the opportunities for doing a, a presentation in a bookstore have gone up exponentially. Before, it was like a really big deal. They would only have one person a month, right. maybe two at the most. Mm -hmm. Now they could have one every day if they wanted to. <laughs> And anybody can come in and watch that that presentation. So and I and I think as a result of COVID, one of the side effects is going to be we're going to have a lot more, even when everything is healthy, a lot more virtual events. Uh, Absolutely. Because, because it, it's it's so easy for them to do. Yep. So that the is, bookstore that is, doesn't have to be open. It doesn't have to be staffed. No. Yeah. It's a great avenue for doing marketing and it's, it's, it's free, <laughs> basically, right? Yeah. Great. I mean, I think to, to follow up on that, Stephen, that we always find that the most success that we get in a publicity campaign is when our authors are gung-ho on doing just as much as they can on their end. Like every interview, every podcast, I'll have an excerpt in any place that wants to put it out. Um, the importance of just being game to, you know, just grab it and go after every single eyeball that you can is hard to understate um, because the gains for authors are, can be challenging. And if you get, like you said, a hundred or so good fans, good readers that can create, lead to a huge platform. Mm. Yep. Yeah. It's just want to, I just want to mention uh, at five o'clock today, Jeff Meyerson, the, uh, the co-owner of the Harvard Bookstore, is going to be speaking. And he, if you if you subscribe to their emails, they they are running virtual events left and right, and they sometimes have two or three a week. Wow. And you know, Deepak Chopra was on the other day. You know, people like that. But they also uh, work with self-published authors. He spoke last year. And they welcome small presses. And you have to sort of get on their radar and, and go talk to the right people. But that's the legwork that, that Stephen was talking about. You know, they want to help authors because they want to sell books. Now, if you if you wrote a book that nobody wants to read, that's your problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's certainly not true of all bookstores. There's there's a little uh there's a little snobbism involved in selecting people to do presentations in certain bookstores, and I won't mention any names, but um, that that ability to to market to them through um, a, a Zoom video is just incredibly powerful. And I'll tell you why I think it's so incredibly powerful, and that's because I believe that the most important component in your book strategy is you, not the book itself. If people take a, a uh, take a look and an interest in you, they're going to be interested in your book. It's it starts with you, and then it's it spreads to the book. So you have to get yourself out there. You have to let people know what you're all about, and say, "Hey, he looks like a nice guy. She looks like a really smart lady. I want to read her book." Okay. I mean, to answer Gail's question again, maybe more directly. I think that authors should think in the future about who their audiences are um, and mm -hmm. then really challenge themselves to think of audiences that might resonate with their book and their message or their personal story before that they hadn't thought of initially while they were writing the book um, and reach out to those people and try to establish yourselves with them, learn about those groups and uh, yeah, learn about your potential readers and who you think will be interested. And then also think about all the different formats your book could take. Like, would this work well as an audiobook? Because that's one of the fastest growing um, sectors of book sales right now. Um, 
so yeah, just thinking about the entire marketing and distribution aspect of your book as part of the whole project. Think of it holistically. Mm -hmm. And you guys, I just want to, I just want to give a five minute uh, reminder, Jack, we oh, got okay. like five more minutes, so I'll okay. pipe back in in five minutes. This is a great Thank conversation. You. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, Rhodes, as David mentioned that uh, you could do a lot worse than, than reading some of Seth Godin's books. That guy is really good. Oh, I'll check it out. I've, uh, I haven't, I've heard of him, but I haven't, I don't know if I've read his book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> One thing, Rhodes, the last sentence you said made me think about this. Um, and then I forgot what I was going to say. So <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, stop and let somebody else talk. That, that happens more often. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to mention there's a ton of free information out there. So you don't really have to pay a lot to learn how to do book marketing or even how to write very well. But everybody on this panel, the people that are that are gonna be talking over the weekend, we had la last year, we had John Kramer, who wrote a book, A Thousand and One Ways to Market a Book. We reached out to Joanna Penn. These people, you just Google how to market a book. You're gonna find these people eventually. And a lot of them have really good information. It's, and it's not like you have to go pay thousands and thousands. I mean, you can do that, if you can't do it yourself and if you want to go fast you know you should hire an expert but to get started it doesn't cost a lot to go learn something absolutely not jane friedman is another one yeah yeah yep. and she has a newsletter yeah i mean some advice i would like to give to authors that are thinking about doing their own marketing or publicity is that it is supposed to be not supposed to be maybe it's just me but if it feels it makes you feel anxiety and it feels like you know an overwhelming a lot of like amount of work and if, you know if you reach all the people that you think will be interested in you'll never stop reaching out to people it's it is that is the downside of doing marketing it is incredibly tiresome sometimes and uh anxiety producing and that's okay if you're feeling those things um and you know like david said there is information and advice out there that people are willing to give uh, we had another uh, person who asked asked you, Rhodes, if you could talk a little bit more about Book Forward's process. Uh, so the way that we work um, now, I'm, I used to be more of an associate of a publicist, and now I'm the author ambassador. So when an author submits a manuscript and fills out our query form and kind of explains their project, uh, I'm usually the one that'll read the manuscripts and think about pitch angles, media angles, like how we could imagine promoting this book and who we would promote it to and, you know, kind of give it a close reading um, to pull out as many creative ideas um, as we can and then consider the budget that we have and I'll usually respond, interview the author, kind of learn more about their project from them and write up a campaign proposal uh, usually based on what we've said and for us a full campaign we usually run about six months and they're heavily research-based and kind of customized we're all former journalists so we know how to we know what it's like to get pitches and we know how to do a lot of research and um gumshoeing is that the right word <laughs> uh, so th that's to be really broad and um unspecific uh that is our process so are there some people you just say sorry can't help you your book sucks no, i will never say that your book sucks <laughs> uh, and we don't think that uh, sometimes i just get books that aren't ready and i like i said before yeah. i don't want them to i don't want to sell them anything that i think is one going to be really hard for us to work with because if we get it's frustrating and demoralizing when you have a book that nobody wants to cover, you know? Um, right. And you can like the author as much as you want and really wish that people did. And uh, yeah, okay. you could get a publicity campaign that just doesn't roll out because the book isn't ready. It happens. Mm -hmm. All right, we got 30 seconds left. Steven and Ralph, you wanna make any final comments before we get caught uh, here? 
Yes, uh, these all, have all been great comments and I've really enjoyed being a part of things. I did want to uh, also say, after I said you can do this yourself, uh, it, delegation is always a great thing and you should delegate as much as you can afford because you'll just, otherwise it's gonna kill you to do everything and thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, well, I certainly underscore everything Rhodes and Ralph have said and, and really enjoyed this, uh, this discussion. Um, thanks for the invitation. You're very welcome. Thanks to all of you. I really appreciate you joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And um, we're going to have a special session at the end of the conference, right after, right, like at six o'clock tomorrow night. Um, hope you can attend. We're going to make some awards and, uh, and give out the book book awards for the year and, and some other special cool stuff going on. Okay. What time is that happening? Six o'clock tomorrow night. Oh, tomorrow night. Right. Got it. Tomorrow night. Yeah. All right. Okay. Guys, bye. Uh, yeah, bye. Th thank you. Bye, guys, thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure. That was a great conversation. Thank you.